Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks to those of you who've already signed the letters to the Minister of the Environment asking him to stop the dump, for signing the uh, petition over here at the OPAL um, desk to change the Ontario law, and for signing on to the lists of those who are interested in the alternative visions, the children's land, etc. We invite you now to make yourself comfortable, and I'm quoting a letter that I received recently that I'd be comfortable with the dump eventually, um, to make yourself comfortable on these chairs, and we're not going to try to keep you on them too long because I'm guessing they will become uncomfortable after a while. So this evening has been planned by the Oxford Coalition for Social Justice and by your neighbours in Oxford Greenwatch to give you an opportunity to know who it is that's been driving around stuffing your mailboxes with postcards and flyers, leaflets and letters against um, Walker's proposed dump. That's us. Um, we also want you to have a chance to look at the alternative economic vision that there is at the back, and you'll get some time later to have a look at that as well, to sign on to the petition if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, um, and sign a letter to ask the province to uh, prevent the dump. And also to meet Lucas, who's sitting there, and you can't see him, but he's going to stand up. Um, Lucas made candles out of uh, beeswax, and he made some other things, and he's giving um, all the um, proceeds to charity. So... Um, you might want to talk to him later as well. Most of all, though, what we wanted is to have an opportunity for you to hear from Mr. John Van Toff, our guest speaker, who led farmers and the agricultural community into miskiming in their successful fight against a proposal to pile all of Toronto's garbage onto trains and dump it down a mine shaft. And not only did that sort of remind us when we heard about that of the proposal to ship 100 transport trucks a day into Oxford County, it encouraged us to know that by organizing this kind of dump, can be prevented. So the evening will proceed like this. I'll stop talking pretty soon. You can clap now if you like. <laughs> John will take the microphone and we'll talk to you before about 20 minutes and he's got some slides to show you um, to look at as well. Once he's finished um, taking you through the process by which they won, he'll listen to and answer your questions. During that question period, I get to be the grumpy old man and I'm becoming older and older all the time, and I think grumpier, who reminds you that despite how fascinating the story of your life is or your ideas are, that a question is actually a direct question in a few, sentence, in a few words that he can answer. So what I'm saying is you don't get to do from the floor what I'm doing now. <laughs> so a sample question would be something like, John, how can we get multiple levels of government to cooperate with our community so we can improve and sustain our rural economy? A sample story from the floor, never mind. After the question period, Darwin Cooper, who is here in the back corner, he's going to come up and take the microphone. He's going to remind you of a few things and tell you a few more things that you need to know. And after Darwin Cooper, you have some time in the room yet again um, to talk with your friends and neighbors, to talk about some of the ideas, to hit any of the tables that you didn't previously um, get to, um, to visit the coffee station, which should be perked by then. Um, and that will be the end of the evening, and at that point you can then go have the inevitable conversation in the parking lot that always happens after people get together, or you can just go home to a well-deserved rest. I'll do a brief introduction now of, of John Van Toff. He's an elected member of the legislature at Queen's Park resent, uh, representing Timiskaming Cochrane. For those of you who haven't been that far north, it is far north, but it's well worth the visit. I've been there, and I love it. Uh, he was elected in 2011, though he previously ran in, in 2007 proving he doesn't give up easy. In 2011, he appeared on TVO's The Agenda to talk about how a family member of our local MPP ended up first as a member of the NDP and as agriculture critic. John is taking an interest in our area and dump when the coalition was lobbying at Queen's Park to stop the dump. He listened very intently to the arguments we brought forward, saying that Walker's proposal for a dump at Beachville was not a, a starter. He declared on TVO that I'm a worker, not a walker. We're not sure if he had a capital W on that or not. He'll probably explain that. And he's also said, I aspire to do the best job I can. And I'm hoping that you will be impressed with him this evening. The Adams Mine Project is a project as disastrous for his reason as Walker's project would be a disaster for us. And that's, um, has, that's what engaged him in the political process. Today he's the critic for agriculture, food, and rural affairs, which means he speaks as a farmer in northern Ontario very directly to the issues that are close to up. Ladies and gentlemen, John Van Toff. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, just to be clear, uh, half my family is, my extended family is, is here tonight. I was born in Ingersoll, and Ernie Hardiman is my uncle. And it's a standing joke that he's the reason I'm NDP. <laughs> 
but it isn't true. <laughs> it, isn't, <laughs> it isn't true. We get along on, on many, many issues. Um, we do have different political values, but I'm proud that he's my uncle, and I'm uh, very proud to be here tonight. I'm not a, uh, a water expert, a dump expert. I'm a farmer. I've been a dairy farmer my whole life. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes how I got involved in Adam's Mine, the things we learned, and the things that I think that the advice we could offer you. And I'm going to say from the outset, I'm not against landfill in principle. I never have been, uh, and I won't be, for the simple fact that I don't believe that any business, and that's what I said when I was a farmer, when I'm, I don't believe anyone should have a right to stand up at the end of the, your laneway and say, you can't do it because we don't like you. I don't think that should be for farmers either. Right? If you can prove that you're not going to impact someone else's way of life or quality of life, I think you should have the, your right and ability to prove it. Having said that, you have to prove it. So I'm going to give you a short, that's the Adams Mine site. Um, you can see two pits. Uh, when it was first proposed in the late 80s, when the mine was closing, they were going to use five pits and it was going to store 65 million tons of, uh, of garbage. I got involved in 1995, and on behalf of the TFA, which is the Timiskaming Federation of Agriculture, and we'll do, which slide am I going to give you? Slide 34. And those are some of the farms. So if you don't think there's farms in Northern Ontario, those are the farms in my neighborhood. So in our, our goal was... Uh, we were given a seat on the Public Liaison Committee, which is basically the same thing as the co Community Liaison Committee that's been struck here. And our goal was to make sure that uh, our water wasn't impacted. We worked very close with the proponents' consultants. We worked very closely with the proponents, the peer reviewers. The peer reviewers, and I, I looked on, on, on the, the Oxford County site, and you also have a peer review team. They did a really good job. But the peer reviewer is paid by the proponent. And that's something that's a problem. And I'll get into that later. So Metro Toronto, Metro Toronto decided to uh, back out. And the reason they backed out the first time was public opposition. And public opposition is very important. That's the reason they backed out the first time. The second time, the proponent or the owner of the pit came back and said, we've got a new plan. We're just going to use one pit. That's the south pit. It's 65 acres at the rim. It's 600 feet deep. It's full of 300 feet of groundwater. And the way they were going to do it is they were going to pump it out, and the water gushing in, there was going to be no, no liner. The water gushing in was going to keep the leachate from coming out. No, 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 and, and that, would, that would work as long as you kept pumping it, as long as you kept it empty. The tricky part was they were going to stop pumping, and then the leachate was going to rise to the top, and, then it, and they were going to have a drain about 20 feet from the top, and then the, the, the leachate was going to rise and drain into a treatment plant. The problem is that this pit is 300 feet up in the air, it's not, a, it, you think of a mine, but it's a hill. It's a big iron ore hill. When the glaciers went over, they didn't take that hill. So that's the level of groundwater. So they drilled, and I can show you, but they drilled a couple holes underneath to prove that the water was rising. And we didn't believe it. A lot of people didn't believe it. We went to an environmental assessment board hearing. We did the whole thing. Went to an environmental assessment board hearing. It was a split decision. Two people believed that it would work. One person didn't. As a result, the Environmental Assessment Board said, you've got to drill a couple more holes to prove your theory. And based on those holes, the minister approved it. It's a fully approved site. So, but there was a lot of, and once again, it's really important, there was a lot of public opposition. So that, among other things, delayed construction. And here's why it's really important for, you always have to pay attention to these things to, because they use, they're smart people. And, and they're not really, out, they're out to do their job. They use really big words. But I remember when I first got on the PLC, one of the hydrogeologists for the proponents said, 
if we it's going to be so safe and if we don't pump it eventually it's going to overflow that's how come because the water so much water coming so we thought of that so we decided a few of us for a year we went to measure the water because if it's eventually going to overflow and there's that much water coming in you should be able to see it rise we measured it for a year and it didn't go up at all. So we said, whoa, 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 wait a second. This, the thing that, that, that this thing is approved on, it doesn't work. Now keep in mind, this was approved by the ministry. It was, the proposal was done by a very well-respected, I'm not going to say their name, a very well high, well-respected hydrogeologic company. It was peer-reviewed by an equally well-respected hydrogeologic company. So here we're coming along and say, wait a second, we think you goofed. Well, the ministry didn't want to hear anything. Basically told us to go away. So what we did, the Federation of Agriculture did, we found someone willing to do a critical analysis of the ministry's approval. Somebody qualified to do a critical, and that's it's a scientific term, there's not too many people in the province capable, qualified, or willing. Because you will find out there's not too many people who are willing to cross. A cro- you know, who are willing to, you know, there's kind of a, it's like a, a, a groundwater club. <laughs> and not too many people are willing to really say to the other company, wait a second, like that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. They'll say nice thing, well, you know, well, no, I think maybe you could do this different or that different, but they're, there's not too many people willing to say, that's crazy. Anyway, this guy was qualified and willing. We went and said, all we want to know is we went to measure the water. It didn't move for a year. We're not, and we told the ministry, the ministry didn't listen to us. It's fully approved. Will you look at what the ministry did and what the proponent did? And will you tell us, you know, if, if, if what we're seeing is right or if we're just wasting our time. Um, he came back. His initial review said, you know what? You guys have a point. So when he told us that, we wrote a letter to the premier saying, wait a second, this thing is approved, but there's a problem, and we're going to release a report, and we're asking you to pull the license. The ministry ignored it. The premier ignored it. But the proponent didn't, he sued us for going after his business. Keep in mind, once again, this thing was fully approved. So he had a a reason. Then the report came out from the critical analysis. And basically, the critical analysis said that he couldn't tell if the site was going to leak, but neither could the ministry, and they never should have approved it on that basis. And the ministry tried to throw stuff at us, and the ministry tried to backpedal. At the end of the day, what happened is the the government passed the Adams Mine Lake Act so that an open pit can never be pumped to become a dump. The Adams Mine Lake Act. And the reason they passed it, in my opinion, is they didn't want to admit that somebody goofed and passed something that never should have been passed. And that's, and when I went to talk to the committee who was looking at it, I was one of the few people, I, w- I opposed the Adams Mine Lake Act. Not because I was not, I was happy that it stopped. But it didn't solve the problem. And in simple terms, what they did, and, and I, the, what they, how they proved it, and what they failed at, they had, they, they drilled the holes, and then they take, Pressure readings, how much pressure. But they they do it on a computer model. It's a prediction. So what they told the computer, basically, they didn't tell the computer that Adam's mind was on a hill. They told the computer that Adam's mind was in a hole so that so that the computer just assumed that okay, these low pressure were just gonna increase. If you fill it up and it's tight, it's gonna they never told the computer. They never punched in accurate numbers. And when they did that, and when they, <laughs> so there's a way to prove Adam's mind. And in the critical analysis, is he said, 
I can't tell you if it's going to leak. What you should do is keep doing what they're doing, measure the water, keep testing. Three to five years, you'll prove it. They didn't do that. They ran. So there's a few things that I want to save you some time. And uh, you're doing all the right things. Because you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you can, we could have, we could have had the best argument in the world, and we did, and we won. But if no one had been out there banging the drum, we still would have been ignored. So it's, you have to keep public pressure on. That's really important. And even if it doesn't stop it, it'll make it safer. Because the one thing in that critical analysis, And I have a lot of respect for this guy. I'm not going to advertise for people, so I'm not going to say his name. If you ask me after, I'll tell you. He didn't fault the proponent or the proponent's consultants. Because the consultants, they're paid by the proponent, and they're paid to make the results look good. So the Walker's consultants are going to have an answer for everything, because that's their job. That's that's their job, okay, and 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 that's that's the way the business works, and the peer review is doing. A, I, I read the peer, and I'm not an expert, but just the peer review is doing their job too, right? But one place that I don't think it's strong enough, and I couldn't find anything really on groundwater really relevant. There's a place you guys have to watch out. It's groundwater. Because once again, when they start talking modeling, and that's the way it's done. Every time they say modeling, think prediction. <laughs> They're just predicting. So, you know, you have to make sure. Because they, they have about uh, 20 things. They've got uh, noise, dust, uh, uh, disease vectors. They're all important. All, there's, there's not nothing that's unimportant. Okay. But dust is something you can deal with because dust is above ground. But once the site is built, there's no, there's no second guessing the groundwater. It's either going to work or it's not. And in this case, and I'll use, and once again, this didn't happen in 1852. Okay, and I can't talk about your case because I don't have, but this one, you know, was all using current technology, was all, and one more anecdote in this case. Because the government took their license and didn't, no, because the government said you couldn't use it for landfill and didn't take their license, the proponent, all their, all their costs were covered. You guys paid for it. Your taxes <laughs> paid all the investors, except one, because he didn't want the money, and he took it to the World, uh, to the World Trade Tribunal because the Ontario government was stopping him from using this landfill. So the government of Canada had to defend Ontario, and they they sent a bunch of experts to interview us all. And one of the government lawyers asked me what the closest farm was, and I told him. And he said, "Well, I said, but what difference does it make? You know, because he says, well, because if it leaks, it leaks. You know, and, and the argument is whether it leaks. He says, no, that's not the argument. We all know it's going to leak like a sieve." And that was approved in 2003. That's not that long ago. So can I stand here and tell you that, that the Walker site is bad or good? No. I can tell you that it's, it's very problematic because you're dealing in fractured rock. I can really tell you you've really got to watch out how they're going to treat the groundwater. Something else, I'm gonna, uh, a tip I'm going to give you is based on from what their website, you're looking at a running target. Because if you remember, there was originally there was five pits, and first the pits were going to be lined, and that didn't work, and then they were going to be half-lined, and that didn't work, and then they came up with hydraulic containment. Oh, and that one's supposed to work. You're going after a running target. They're going to, they're, they're looking for ways to make it work. And they're, you know, and, and if it works, if it works, that's great. But once again, the proponents, consultants, their job is to make it look as favorable as possible for the proponent. And if you want me to get the critical analysis and read it to you, 
I'd be happy to do that, but that's that's their job. The peer review's job is to make sure that they're doing things according to commonly accepted practice. Well, once again, the peer review is paid for by the proponent. He's working for the peer PL the CLC, but he's paid for by the proponent. So this is a very rich agricultural area. And if I was recommending something to the people <laughs> around this site, that I would raise some money and I would start looking for my own groundwater people to make sure, to make sure that if they're going to move ahead with this, that it's got to be done right. And something, when this proposal was originally proposed, we had a bunch of... Uh, Meetings like this, we went through all kinds of meetings like this. This took 10 years. And we'd had people who worked in the site and said, ah, that'll never work. And they, and they were right. But they were ignored. And they were ignored because they weren't qualified. So you can have the best argument in the world, but you need the right people at the right time saying it. And when we, had, when we finally got the right person at the right time, it worked a lot better. I'm going to close at the same time. During, this was about like a, this wasn't even a hockey game. This was like a tournament. It was like three periods in overtime. And in between one of those periods, another company was going to build a PCB incinerator. <laughs> and I was, I was the head of the Federation of Agriculture, and I was a dairy farmer. And... We decided we weren't going to do this the same way. So for this project, we spent we spent a lot of money. In those times, we spent $120,000 on that PCB project, and it was dead within six months because we hired our own experts. We hired, and we said, we're not against it. you got to prove it. And who we put the most pressure on, you put them, because it's the ministry that approves them. Okay? All and not just the Ministry of, of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, all the, but when the ministries realized that we were serious and, and that they would have to deal with us as well, then they started doing their job. And when the ministry realized that they'd made a mistake, that's when the Adams Mile Lake Act came into being. So you can have the best argument but a few things you got to remember. Proponents make the project look good. Peer reviews are doing their job, but they're paid for by the proponent. You got to pay for your own experts. That's a sad thing to say. But if it comes to the point, and there's all kinds of things you can do before, you're doing all the right things, and hopefully you won't get to this point. But if you get to this point that you're in the EA process, and even right now in the terms of reference, I would push to make groundwater much, much higher in the terms of reference. You're gonna need you're gonna need your own experts and you're gonna need the right ones. And know that by experience. And uh, it's uh, a gentleman up here asked me if, if the rules if the rules are strong enough, the rules are strong enough. You gotta make sure they're applied. And that's not as easy as it sounds, but it's not impossible. Not at all. Anyway, I don't know if I'm gone. I usually go over my time, so that's that's my spiel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to John. Thanks for thanking John. Um, it's now time for your questions, and I hope that as you form the questions, you counted the words in them in your head, and when you got to a dozen, you decided to shorten it. Um, remember that you can't do what I did at the beginning. You can't get to ra you don't get to ramble or speechify. But if you do have questions, we'd be very glad to hear your questions. Um, we don't have mics, so we'd ask you to get up and use a voice that would be heard across the field. Um, and um, if your voice isn't particularly loud, then perhaps you can say it, and John will address the question in his answer as well. Okay. So um, yes, we have somebody in the front. How? Who's the best? group or organization to, to come forward to uh, ensure that the groundwater won't be damaged? Like. That, that's a really good question. 
uh, and I missed that part. One thing that's really important, okay, the people, and th that's why the Farmers Federation of Agriculture took the groundwater question, and why we were really careful, and still really care, I'm still really careful. I have never been opposed to this in principle. If they could have proved that it was going to work, it's a business, and as a business, you know what? Do I like it? No. Can I live with it? Yes. A business group has to go after the groundwater question. Really. To me, to have the most, because it's, because people who are opposed, and there's nothing wrong with being opposed to the dump in principle. There's nothing wrong with not having it in my backyard. Okay. But the government won't look at it the same as if it's a group of farmers or a group of businessmen saying, look, you know what? Prove to us that that's not going to affect our groundwater. So we, we all work together. There's about 20 groups. We all work together, but we all um, made sure that we had, there were some of us, like the Federation of Agriculture, who weren't, who weren't officially opposed. People knew we were opposed. But when we had the critical analysis done, if the expert had came back and said, you know what, I think it's going to work, we would have been done, and we would have backed off, and everybody knew that. But because we were willing to do that is one of the few reasons that we actually got a guy of that caliber to work for us. Because if he had known that we were going to, even if he had said it's safe and we still were going to beat the drum, he likely wouldn't have worked for us. Because I was really surprised when I looked for this guy. And I didn't know anything about Google or anything. Like that. So I called him up and asked him. And uh, he knew everything about me. He knew. <laughs> he, he knew you know, what I did, he knew, because he wanted to work on this project, but nobody asked him. So he needed, it's just like if you're, if you hire a, a carpenter and the building inspector comes, another carpenter is not going to come on the site and say, well, <laughs> that foundation you're putting, that's a piece of crap, right? But if you ask another carpenter to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Then he'll come on the site. This is the same thing. But you need... I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but someone who's opposed in principle is going to have a harder time getting experts to really go to bat for them. But having said that, it's the people who were opposed in principle who kept this project on the front burner that people actually knew what was going on. You know, we work with First Nations, we worked with environmentalists, we worked with all kinds of people. Sometimes they had lots of internal fights too. But but it's really important that you have that that you Keep your separate identities. I don't know if I answered your question, but business group, I think here, farm group would be ideal. Uh, yeah, you do the picking, I'll do the talking. Uh, how badly did it divide the community? The unity? That is, Kirkland Lake was all for it, yeah. the rest of the riding. Yeah. And it must have been there a large. There was uh, in basically Adam's mine is is kind of the center of of kind of the center of my riding right now. I represent the areas we're opposed as, as well. Um, there were three towns: Kirkland Lake, Largo Lake, and Inglehart, who were totally in favor because they were struggling um, economically, and they just saw it as jobs. And the proponent said it was safe, and the ministry said it was safe, and they were going to get free garbage collection, and they were going to have like a recycling businesses sprout up all over. But the farm communities to the south of the mine, they were opposed because if something did screw up with the water, the water in our area runs south. And the communities in favor were in the north. And yes, there's, uh, I still, even now, and this is quite a few years later, I'm the MPP for Kirk and Lake. I have to be very careful what I talk about about Adam's mine. Oh, yes, because it, it, it divided our community. Th there were times when it wasn't safe for a farmer to walk, for this farmer anyway, to walk at Kirk and Lake. Yeah. And, and, and in one way, that was almost, almost better because it wasn't a sleeper issue. It's one thing you have to watch out for. If, if people don't get excited, the companies are waiting for you to get excited. And if you don't get excited, that's kind of a, a, a tacit approval. It was almost better that it was a huge fight. It was a good question.
How much of the process to stop this is political? That we have to count on our MP or our MPP to stop it? Um, that's a tough one for me since the MPP is my uncle. <laughs> and I'm an MPP. Uh, the MPP is a, and if both provincial and federal, it's a big part of it. But it's it's up to the people to push. The MPP is just, I'm just the voice for my area. And the harder my area pushes me, the bigger my voice gets, right? If there's somebody kicking me, I kick ahead. And so it's not fair to, to say, oh, okay, he'll take care of it, because he can't, not by himself. Did he say First Nations? Cool. Cool. Very good question. Um, originally, First Nations weren't consulted in this proposal. Um, why it was really uh, tricky is because th this site's in Ontario, and the First Nations that claim claim um, rights over this part of Ontario, their home base is in Quebec. So right away, they weren't recognized. And the First Nations... Um, were played a huge role in this. Like, I'm going to back up for a second. There's about 20 groups, 20 people at eat who, at certain times, played a critical role. And if they weren't there that time, we would have lost. And the First Nations were there a lot. The First Nations went to the United Nations. The First Na they they did incredible stuff. But at the end, it was we would have lost. We would have we would have lost without them, and they would have lost without us. But they played an incredible role. Hi, John. You mentioned um, pushing groundwater before coming to QR. Yeah. Okay. Are you meaning like push for more receptor points, additional testing? One? Can you give us an example, please? I. I, I think no. I don't. I don't. I I don't mean more points. I mean that there's so many things in a terms of reference that, you know, like we spent, I know in our, and I can't comment on this one again because I'm not involved, in, but I, I know in ours, okay, we spent in the initial, before before the we went to the hearing, we spent as much time talking about birds as we spent talking about groundwater. And that's good for the proponent, but it's not good for the people. And and you know what? And maybe that maybe this site's different. Maybe this site groundwater isn't the number one issue, but I'll bet it is. I'll bet it is. So like on on this one, this was this was, and your site's much different. Your site has got like towns close, and this one doesn't. It's a it's a good site for most things, not for groundwater. So they had a whole report about whether the noise was going to be... The, the noise impact report was almost as big as a groundwater report. This is an abandoned iron ore mine in the middle. The closest house is like 10 kilometers, and they blew it up with millions or thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate. I think the animals are used to the noise. No, really. You know, but yet it had to be checked on the box. And we could have, knowing that, we could have said, okay, let, let's... Okay, noise is important, but... Let's really spend our time making sure groundwater is right. You know, because no, on, on, on this site, dust is important because you're much closer to people. On this one, dust really wasn't a big problem. You know, same with Wetchko. We spent a lot of time talking about, uh, and that is a big issue. I saw um, in yours, they were talking about uh, vectors for disease, and they mentioned birds, and they didn't mention anything else. Well, on this site, rats. Rats aren't a problem. We don't have rats in North Ontario yet. But bears are a big problem. Right? But bears are not as important as groundwater. Because bears are above ground. We can deal with the bears, we have to deal with the bears. So I'm not asking for more wells. I'm asking for more at this yet yeah, in the future you might have to ask for more wells, but focus on groundwater. Can you 
Can you tell me why there's not more concentration in people talking about how much garbage does come out of Toronto, and why are they not really recycling like they should be? I mean, there's hundreds of high-rise buildings that don't recycle, and I know that because I lived there for 40 years. And, and I live there now for six months a year. And I lived in the country all my life, and now I live for six months a year at 633 Bay Street on the seventh floor, and there's one garbage chute, and there's one garbage chute with no recycling. And, and we had the same argument in 1995, you know, and it's a valid argument. But my advice is that argument isn't going to make this site any safer. So it's a really good argument. I'm not discounting any argument. It's not the one because it's it's a long term it's a long term argument. And believe me, government is trying to look at doing more recycling. But there's still gonna be somewhere there's gonna be a need for a landfill. So So, so I, mean, I understand groundwater, and I don't know whether it's an issue that you had uh, in, in this particular site, but this, but this site is also adjacent to the Thames River. So, so is surface water, could that be pushed along with groundwater? Yes, surface water is a big issue, in my opinion, maybe not. Like, I, I don't want to give the wrong imp impression that I'm discounting any issue. Not, not at all. Okay, because it very well might be that there's as another issue that that will sink this project and won't be groundwater. So I'm not saying that surface water isn't as important. It is, but it's easier to manage surface water. And if you really think of it, and I don't know how how they're going to do the treatment plant, okay? But in our in this case, they were going to pump it out, treat it, and dump it in the river. So, so. So in, we, were, we had a whole discussion about the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario, if, if everything went wrong, it would leak and flow into the river. And I said, well, what's the difference? You know, like, it, and, and, and so surface water is easier to manage. It is. Groundwater is, re especially in rock, because the one thing, and I'm not a hydrogen, Larry, if you please correct me if I'm wrong. If, if your site was in a 100 feet of clay, you could drill wells and detect easier if there's a leak. But in fractured rock, you can drill a well here, and it could be leaking 10 feet beside, and you won't know it, especially if it's on a hill like this site. You know, it's really hard in fractured rock to, to I've got a, if, we don't have time for this, but I have like a, a we did a whole model of how this is all going to work, and not a computer model. We actually did it physically, like a big aquarium. And that's one of the things that the ministry had to back off because when we started sending us around to various ministries, <laughs> that's one of the things that they had to back off. So everything's important, but groundwater is the one they like to avoid. I'd like to uh, ask if there's six or seven countries in the world that are experiencing negative landfill growth because they have the political will to deal with it properly. Mm -hmm. What right does a politician, a ministry, or any group within this province anymore, what right do they have to even entertain putting our water at risk? And who's not doing the job in that group? Again, a really good question. And my answer as a politician is like my answer a little while ago politicians okay are the voice of the people and in this country and in this province there is an awful lot of people who do not want to pay for the true cost of recycling the true cost of 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 avoiding landfill so you know what <laughs> and that's why so if if a government came forward right now and said you know what <laughs> That's it. <laughs> We've had enough of this crap. We are going to go to, you know, like what some European countries do, like 5%, you know, or 95% waste diversion. They'd be thrown out of office because the costs, it's like, remember we had a big, a few, few months ago, we had a big uproar in rural Ontario about the tire tax because they were actually going to charge what it costs to recycle a farm tire. <laughs> you know, so 
Politicians are the voice of the people. If the majority of the people said, we want to pay what the actual cost is, it wouldn't take long. But right now, we're not there. What are the 20 groups? Whoa. Um, I'd say uh, uh, six or seven First Nations. Um, we had a group of like, um, and I don't want to offend anybody, uh, radical environmentalists. You know, the we call them tree huggers, where we come from. <laughs> okay. No, okay, no, but you know, <laughs> the, 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 guys, the guys who would, would, who would happily go to 95% waste diversion, we had a, some of them. We had um, uh, some business groups, uh, farmers. Um, a lot of uh, our most effective, not our most effective, but the overall, we had seniors groups. Seniors groups are great because the original time in 95 when Toronto backed down, the reason they backed down is because the seniors decided that they were going to phone Metro Toronto City Hall and complain. And they shut the phone lines down. <laughs> and it's stuff like it's stuff like that. That, you know, and it it's it's groups like groups who you don't who do you don't think of were some of the most effective. Can I ask this question? Sure. Where is the garbage supposed to come from? The garbage that they're talking about for your for this site, just judging by what I read in the in the um, companies uh, on the net, it's the same garbage that we were fighting in 1995. It's garbage from from all of Ontario. Why don't they recycle it all? Why where it come from? <laughs> I recycle my I recycle plastic bags. You're doing a lot better job than most of us, and like the people in downtown Toronto, in all those condos, they produce a lot of garbage. But, but, I understand there are truckloads of bottled water being shipped from the east side of Woodstock and it goes all to the states and all over the place. It's not checked for because it's city water. It's not checked for its quality. Most of the bottled water that is shipped is not checked ever. Why can't those guys that are selling bottled water be brought into this? Is this would really endanger their quality of water they're shipping to the states. It's a good idea. Like that guy's thinking. He's thinking already. Who are the people you guys can approach to make your voice stronger? Yes. Hi, Fraser Parsons. I just have a quick question. Uh, the issue of groundwater is pretty definite, but um, the proponent has this issue, the technical issue of the protective liner, which it will say, even if the case is made about the sense of the uh, vulnerability of the groundwater, that this liner will save the day. Do you have any thoughts or ideas about that issue? Or no? Look around for uh, find dump sites that have protected liners that aren't leaking. They're few and far between. And something about a, especially a dump of this this size, okay. A liner is a manufactured product, okay. The Adams Mine, when they first started talking about it, it was going to be dangerous for 50 years. When they, when we actually, when another group got the right experts to actually 
make them come up with the right numbers, it was going to be dangerous for a thousand years. There's no liner that's going to last that long. And it's just... <laughs> so, make... And if, if there is a super liner out there, fine. Make them prove it. That's the biggest thing. Make them... Because they're going to say it's going to work. That's their job. And just like our final expert, he didn't fault them for it. That's their job. Unfortunately, it's your job to make them prove it. Yeah, you mentioned that the MOE for the bath on this, but would you did it, correct? Mm -hmm. Why do we have the, the public have to fight so damn hard for stuff like this where the MOE knows what the regulations should be and it should be Orson Walker and whoever else is going to impose this? That, that is the question of the day. And when I first got involved with this one, I kept one, I kept sitting at these meetings wondering when the MOE was going to get involved. At the hearings, I kept wondering, but again, the experts were saying it was going to work. And those experts, and they are, they know a lot more about groundwater than I do, ever will. They were saying it was going to work. So the MOE has got all these people saying it's going to work. And on the other side has got people who are just as smart, but they're not experts saying, well, not sure it will. But they're not going to listen to the people who aren't qualified. The MOE don't want the answers. Well, they the, don't the, the MOE, the way it's, the way it's set up, the, M the MOE is, is, and actually the Minister of Environment is the judge. The MOE is kind of the jury. Um, all government ministries listen to the most uh, most qualified people. And when the most qualified people are saying it's a, it's a go, and you're a long ways away from that because they, I, I read through the stuff and these people got a long ways to go. Can I just interject just to say that um, Opal has in fact retained Will Fluent, who is a hydrogeologist, um, that there are other scientists that are also advising our group as well. So some of that expertise is coming on board. Um, my question has to do with conflict of interest within the MOE. So at what point are there going to say, well, you know, we don't want to have a Technically, technically, the MOE works for people like uh, me and Uncle Ernie, right? Um, I think by, unfortunately, unfortunately, it, it, it ends up in your laps, and it ended up in our laps. We're the ones who have to keep the MOE, the MOE uh, unbiased. Because they're not, it, and it's just, it's just the nature of government. It's just the nature, they, they, they listen to it experts and if and if the experts are saying one thing who are they if you're if you're working at the MOE right and you see something that you don't like and I'm this is just hypothetical I'm just and you're the one <laughs> saying wait a second this this multi-billion dollar project that all these people want it's never going to work you know how long you're going to last at the MOE not very long and 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 that's part of the problem I'm getting way. I'm getting in lots of trouble for the things I'm saying, but that's. <laughs> this may be a small point, but uh, does that lake have fish in it? Uh, we're looking at a situation where there is a flooded quarry, apparently with fish in it. Um, we certainly know as farmers we're not allowed to destroy any fish <laughs> habitat and this sort of thing. Was there fish there? Is that an issue at all? Or um, actually, in one of the pits that was scheduled to be a. a uh, landfill. There's actually. It's now they have they catch the fish commercially out of it. There was fish there. Um, there was endangered species there. There was. But when a project 
is that big you you a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the things you think should stop it or should once again they will hinder it like every one of those issues is worth looking into everyone like there's a lot of time involved in this but an issue like by itself i don't know if it'll stop this project i really don't know because you know what I, i haven't spent a lot of time on your project it wouldn't have stopped this one was the uh, critical consultant that you hired. How much did it cost? And where did the money come from to pay the guy? And the overall fight, how much money did you spend? And who chipped in? I, I, I'm not going to say how much the individual cost because I, I, I'd be... Okay. Um, I'd say um, the fight to, to stop Adam's mine Would be in the neighborhood of direct costs, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And out of that, um, out of those twenty groups, none of us took any any payment, any mileage, any. That was all for um, what your guys are doing. The leaflet, and because I'm talking about all the groups, not just the federation. Um, you know that the leafleting, the mailing, the organizing, the paying the old ladies' phone bills, stuff like that. It was about like that. What um, the portion that the that the Federation of Agriculture paid um, for the critical analysis for the was about a uh, hundred and uh, yeah about a hundred and forty five thousand. Um, we raised going door to door to businesses. We raised eighty thousand, and we bore the rest. And we, uh, I, I'm no longer president of Federation of Agriculture, so I don't know if that debt is quite paid yet or almost paid. Yeah, you lost me on the law about this lake. Uh, that law stops this lake from being drained and filled stops, with starters. If, if your quarry fills with groundwater, <laughs> unless they change that law, that law would apply to your quarry. Well, I, I personally don't understand that I've got people that work there, and they say they're constantly they're pumping. raining it. <laughs> they're pumping. And I know if I dig a eight foot hole in my backyard, it will fill yep. with groundwater. Yep. And why doesn't either a legislator who passed this law or an expert say you have a giant hole there? It's just going to attract but, groundwater. But the giant hole, the way the legislation, and once again, I didn't write this legislation, and I opposed it, but the legislation. Is works there because that groundwater is there because they stopped pumping. They stopped pumping in the 80s, and that in one way it works against you, and for it works for you and against you because there is a good chance that if they stop, if this if the quarry was done, and I think your this quarry is an ongoing operation, so it's not that simple. But if if the quarry filled up with water, it would no longer be an issue because you wouldn't be able to pump it. And it's it's not the right it's not a good law. They they put this law in to get themselves out of hot water because they screwed up on the environmental assessment. So they created this law and everybody was happy that the fight was over. And our problem was over, but it didn't help and that's why I was most most upset. It didn't help the next group. It's not helping you because those mistakes are still out there. And if they had to actually say, "Well, wait a second, what went wrong at Adam's mine, so that we can find, so we can stop it from happening again?" They never did that. They covered it up. Is there any way that we can recover any of these costs after the fact from the government or from the water? Um, um, if you're a lot luckier than us, <laughs> we we didn't get any. We didn't get anything back. All the all the. Uh, Proponents got money back because of because of the way that was set up, and uh, we didn't get any money back. Yeah. Is that a question, Mike? Uh, no, I'm 
It's a really good comment. I'd like to know why your uncle isn't here to support you tonight. Actually, actually, I talked to my uncle today, and my I left at three o'clock. I left the legislature, and he had a lot longer in the legislature than I did. So, no, I'm not my uncle's keeper. But my uncle needs to be pushed, just like my MPP needed to be pushed. And now that I'm in it, and I'm, I wouldn't say this for everybody, I'm just going to say this because he's my uncle. Okay, It was a lot easier for me to kick this issue to death before I was an, M an MPP. Because I only had to work for the farmers, the people who I, and I really didn't care if the people of Kirk and Lake at that point in time hated me. It'd be a lot harder for me right now to fight this issue. So because an MPP, an MP, work for everybody. So they have to be pushed, all of them. Liquid manure kind of works on him. <laughs> Especially, especially for for farmers, and for anyone, you have uh, you have a huge investment in your farm, in your house, and there is no denying it's gonna it's gonna be more difficult to sell your house, sell your farm. There's no denying that. A little bit, not a lot. If there is a groundwater problem or a surface water problem, it's gonna be a lot more difficult. And and that's you're you're not, you're not doing anything more than protecting your investment. When we were fighting, when we were fighting Asmine, I showed you the pictures of the farms, and the farms down here are are you know I won't say they're better, but as good as ours. <laughs> they're worth a lot more money than ours, but you know it's not per per farmer. It's not a big investment. They have to realize that. And once again, you're not investing it. To stop it, you're investing money to make it safe. And maybe stopping is the only way to make it safe. But you know what? If you don't invest any money and you don't do anything to protect yourself, especially after you've been warned, then you're kind of on your own if something goes wrong. Because the Ministry of Environment, you know, all those people who say the Ministry of Environment, it's their job, it's supposed to be their job, but they listen to experts. And if they're only hearing experts from one side, you're not going to get the outcome, you're not going to get the safest outcome possible. Hey, Chase, your uncle. Um, if the proponent has said that you're going to have possibly 25 entry level jobs in the business as far as economic gain is concerned. And when we went to town council and I listened to tourism Oxford person speak and her estimations were definitely far greater numerically mm -hmm. as far as losses are concerned. And that's all really yeah. publicly stated. Yeah. If the waste is all coming from outside the diamond what possible thing could our MPP be protecting rather than losing the charts? I, I can't speak for your MPP. <laughs> and I don't want to get him in. I, I don't mind getting myself in trouble. I don't want to get him in trouble. Um, he can do that all by himself. 
Um, I'm, I'm just saying it's, 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 it's the nature of politics to um, not stir any more than you have to. And, and like your, your, your example about, the, about the, the 20 jobs and more jobs in tourism, again, I'm not trying to, like, that's a really good fact, and that should be pushed. Like, that should be rammed down somebody's throat. You know, because when the, the second time when we fought the PCB incinerator, we spent quite a bit of money and we rammed it down the Ministry of Agriculture's throat. So the way it works, you get a, a preliminary assessment. And when I'm just going to take a minute to do this. So the preliminary assessment on the PCB incinerator, it, it had like one and a half paragraphs about agriculture, how agriculture really wouldn't be impacted and blah, 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 blah. So then <laughs> when we went and we hired experts, and we went after the Ministry of Agriculture and said, look, we're not coming after the guy who's building the incinerator. We're coming after you because you didn't do your job. Then in the second, in the assessment where they didn't get their approval, there was like 18 pages from the Ministry of Agriculture. You couldn't build an outhouse in Temiskaming if, <laughs> if it was going to hurt agriculture. Which again is an overreaction which shows you that, that it doesn't work. Right? That shouldn't be. They should just do their job, and you wouldn't have to worry about it. But the first time they didn't, and then they overreacted. And as a farmer, I didn't like that either, because that showed me that if I'm going to build a piece in my barn and somebody pushed the right buttons, they could stop me. I didn't like that either. But you gotta, you got to exercise. you got to push all the right buttons to make sure that this thing's going to be safe. <laughs> I think the people are the experts what they go up in the state water or not. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the engineers don't know what they're doing, but I think people are, they're all around their smart. So they're all about I agree. Safe drinking water and then not just sitting there. It all takes one option and then what's the And how long is that line going to be guaranteed for? We don't just wait a year, so it could be the same reason. Once it's put in and once it's covered, there's no guarantee. So, but but again, you know, the 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 opinion of the people really matters, because without without the opinion, in a, and I can't talk about this case, but in this case, if we didn't have the people behind us, they could, probably could have shoved that critical analysis under the, and I still would have been getting sued. I wouldn't be here. I'd be trying to still pay off my legal fees. So, people power is really important. Do they have an alternative? Uh uh, they, they they will have contingency plans. Um, some of them, some of which don't make sense, but they will have. They they will. When you ask that question, the proponent will have an answer. Like he'll he'll have all the questions answered. Where you get into trouble, it's not usually the first. It's where it's twenty five years from now, when. The proponent's gone, you know, and and there's nobody going to come and fix it. And if you go to other landfills across Ontario, there's all kinds of problems. Not all of them, but and especially on a mega one, because I keep pointing to this one, but this one they're not picking this site because it's the best site. They're picking this site because it's a big hole. <laughs> and that's that's and why they picked this one, it wasn't because this was the best site, but this one was an even better site because it was a big hole in the middle of nowhere. This was the perfect site, and they were really angry when 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 it didn't happen. But it was a bad site environmentally. So it's the same thing. They're picking this site because it's it's and if I was a business person in that business, I might be doing the same thing. Thank you, Brian. Uh, two comments and a question. First of all, I just want to comment on your candy uh, resemblance to your uncle. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to uh, tell him that when I see him. And uh, what I just performed, he put on, and uh, I'll remind him of that. Um, the second one is uh, I'm so glad that. We're endorsing a plan that our community groups have uh, put together. We have a hydro shuttle that we uh, we have an air quality person. We have SELA, the uh, Canadian uh, Legal Council, that's working with it. And these are 
while helping us a little more aware of our component to mitigate the costs that uh, you incurred up in uh, personal care. So I want to congratulate the groups that have worked hard. And I see a lot of individuals from here who started with us over a year and a half ago that we have been following the work plan and it is going forward and it is working. We are working our component down. We need to continue that. I think what you said was bang on. And I'm glad everybody here is getting that understanding. My question to you is, what else can we do? What other stones have we left unturned that you think that we need to do here? Um, I think, uh, just judging from 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 the from the room tonight, and again, I'm just. This is just from my experience. My we started get we had we started with when I first started in this project we started with rooms of ten I bet you guys were there at one point and then twenty and thirty and when we got powerful and once again this took a lot of years so we thought we won and then it came back and it was one but there were times when we could fill rooms of two thousand there were times when and I don't condone this but we blocked train travel. And you need you need you need experts, but you need the people behind you. Because the, the companies on the other side, they gauge they gauge the difficulty. I'm sure there's somebody from the other side here. They gauge the difficulty by how many people, people are. And I, if I was running this thing, I'd be here too. You know, they gauge the difficulty by how much how much people are opposed you need you need all kinds there's no single fight that's going to make this site safe there's a lot of site there's a lot of fights and if once again if making if the only way to make this site safe is stop it it's going to take a lot of fights and it depends how, and I don't know how serious the company is. If the company, this guy was really serious. It took, <laughs> like, he spent 20 years of his life too. Okay, well, then it's going to, then you've got a long road ahead of you. Not going to, not going to sugarcoat it. I'm just wondering if you're a, uh, uh, handbook for municipal counselors on writing documents. <laughs> <laughs> I just left the meeting today, tonight, to meet yourself. It's a community that's going to be impacted most by this. And in the report, the boundary justice, where they'd like to grow to. And the cheapest, best, most practical thing for them for residential growth is to go north. They work for two weeks, work Fair farmland, everything else. It says that one of the warnings is that because of the proposed land trail, it may be difficult to go up that way. So they have written off that entire spot, but in the public meeting they didn't meet tonight, not one word was mentioned about the land trail, not by the economic development officer that made the report, or not one by the mayor or any of the counselor. And it's interesting from the start where your focus goes. But the best education I get is from the Zora Township site on the dump, and the best teachers are from the county of the dump. And it's just, it's, is there anything, any words of wisdom that you can get that hot so that we can put pressure on the municipal council? Some of them are very, 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 very big. Some of the meetings, you know, won't make any any part of it, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's unfortunate because I think the company should educate itself on it. Um, it's it's hard for one one level of government to comment another level of government, but the way to put pressure on any kind of politician is pushing. That's 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 how that's how I react to issues. That's an this one, I did this, I led the farmers to this, and I would do it all again. But as it, but it's, 
this one was like a labor of love almost. I don't know how I could do that. But but when politics is your sideline or like for me, like your job, you got to push them. You know, that's why they have elections. That's you know, really, if, you, if they don't have elections, we all become senators. <laughs> really? No, but really, like that's that that politicians are your voice. That's really all we are. We're we're the voice, and so if you want the voice to represent what you're saying, you got to be the one poking the hardest with facts. We're done. Cool. I'm I'm gonna stick around after if you have some other questions. Thank you, John. I just want to say the uh, coalition, uh, the Oxford Coalition for Social Justice and Green Watch are happy to have everyone here tonight. And on behalf of everyone here tonight, we would like to thank John Ventoff for coming and showing his, sharing his story. And as a token of his appreciation, we have a small gift. Also, I think Lucas is here, and he has a gift to share with Mr. Vantoff. I'm back on. After uh, hearing from Mr. Vanthoff, um, we'd like to invite everyone here to take some uh, time, sign the lists, um, have the materials emailed to you. Um, we do also have a door prize. Can we call out lucky number seven? Jim McGee, where is he? Come on up, Jim. We have a small door prize for you. It is a Allied Flotation Tank De-Icer. I hope you have cattle. <laughs> so lastly, um, if, if you folks would like to uh, avail yourself of the tables, uh, both sides, there is coffee. Uh, I think we have water and we have some we don't have water. We have some coffee, and we have nibblies at the back there. Um, we would welcome any donations to help uh, continue the fight. Um, see anyone at the tables, and they can direct you to that. And again, thank you for coming tonight.